Fernando. Uh, I, I gotta confess before I came up here, um, I told some of my friends that you know when I come up here, I want you to just imagine yourself as a teenage girl, and I'm Justin Bieber coming on stage. So just like get, go with that and just scream for me, you know. But uh, yeah, I didn't really hear it, but it's all good. <laughs> Okay, so so I'm gonna I'm, I'm honestly I'm gonna talk a lot more than our previous speaker, um, <laughs> and I'm gonna narrate a story. And it's your job to find out if it's actually true or just some well thought out bullshit. And what I'm gonna narrate is a story, and I'm gonna throw some business concepts along the way because I'll, I'll suggest, you know, we all business, so I'm gonna do that. And this story is just based out of um, Western Mexico in the early 1990s. Uh, the main characters will be myself and my family. And in Western Mexico, 1990s, I come from a, a family that we used to have a cow ranch. You know, and within this ranch, we had we had kill, we had cows, uh, milking cows, in which we would produce milk and cheeses, and we would sell in the local market. And while we used to do this, um, we would play. My family was integrated in a very traditional role in which, let's, for business-related purposes, we were under my dad's leadership. And under my dad's leadership, he's a guy who comes from. He doesn't have an educational background. He didn't finish high school. He didn't even finish middle school. You know, but he's a very resourceful guy. And my mother would play the more passive role. So we would, we would go as far as my dad would go. So while we had this business and we did okay for ourselves, my dad had a big idea one of these days, right? Without consulting anybody, he took a good, a huge gamble, a huge risk, and he sold absolutely all the cows, all the cattle and everything. And he invested all of that money that he got from the cattle and what we call in Mexico a palenque. So what's a palenque? A palenque is a small wooden arena in which right in the middle of the arena you will have a crowd of people that would watch a couple of roosters fight. And when I say fight, I'm talking about you put a blade in their leg and they will fight it out. That's a palenque. So when we invested in this, um, I actually got my first induction when it comes to personal finance. My first lesson in personal finance and in in entrepreneurship. So when we he put this palenque, I actually my mom my mom gave me three hundred pesos and she said, look, every time you get money you're gonna split it into three. I want I want you to grab one third of it and just save it for a rainy day. I want you to grab another third of it and spend it on something if you did a good job, spend it on yourself, doing something that you actually like. And the third the, the, the third third of it, invest it somehow. So you know I'm eight, nine years old and you know we have this family business so I said you know what I'll go to the local store it's actually the only store in the in the main square of the little town that we used to live in, and is their claim to fame was they have products from the U.S. and China. So I went in, I bought some American chocolates, and I would walk in every Saturday, Friday night. I went to this palenque, and I would sell chocolates two for five. And I would walk around this crowd of people, of half drunken, sometimes full drunken men and women, and do my best sales pitch and sell everything that I have. And that's why I got kickstarted into this. The problem with this was that my home state was one of the last states to ban these type of activities. And within less than a year of actually putting this business together, it was actually banned. So when you have you allocate all your resources into one single business and all of a sudden it becomes illegal, when well, you're left with nothing. And when you're left with nothing, and you're you're literally going into clandestine activities and you have people that you have to pay off, you have investors that you have to pay off. Well we had to pay off everybody and we were left with absolutely nothing. And we went back with absolutely nothing. You take into consideration my parents were in their early 40s. They don't, have, they, don't have, they don't have any educational background. So where will they go? They really don't have any job opportunities in the small, in the small town that we were with in the early 1990s. And this is the, a pivotal change in which we changed from my dad's leadership into my mom's leadership. And under that, my mom took the decision and said, you know what, I'm going to do what a lot of these, um, what a lot of Mexican families do. And, I, and she said, I'm going to sell off all the furniture. I'm gonna f I'm gonna buy a one flight a one way ticket back a one way ticket to the U S and start off start off new and fresh and at that time our whole everything that we owned or we had at that in that moment came down to three pieces of luggage that's it my whole family though everything they owned at that time was three pieces of luggage but me personally at that time I didn't care all I knew I was going to Disneyland right <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, we get to the U.S. and I remember one of the first times we actually did. I mean, I think it's probably actually the first night we got there. My mom's attitude was, "Look, I'm not gonna let my family fall down." She took me as the youngest, and she said, "I don't care if I have to clean toilets for a living, but I'm gonna go ahead and leave." 
So the first thing we did the first night she got there is she asked my cousin to write her a piece of paper saying, hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm interested in offering house cleaning services. This is the number you can reach me at. Um, and that's basically it. So we grab, she grabbed about 100 sheets of a blank piece of paper. She will write down by hand in English everything that, you know, all the data that I just mentioned. And then from that day on, every morning we would walk in different neighborhoods. She would take one side of the street, I would take the other side of the street, and we would go into people's mailboxes and put in a letter with the hopes of getting a call back and actually getting hired so we could kickstart our life in this new country, in this new life and everything. So she didn't get a call back. Um, we did this for about a few weeks. Fortunately enough, there was uh, a cousin of hers that we lived there that actually got her a job at a McDonald's. And it's a job that she actually kept for 10 years. So um, after some years of living there, my dad came, came by, my sisters came back. And when we were all together, we lived a very typical immigrant lifestyle. Now what's a very typical immigrant lifestyle? It's folding two, three jobs down. It's no Christmas parties. It's no New Year's parties. It's basically work to just meet the ends of me. And that was life, and I accepted it. But another little, another little lesson that I learned from there is just the power to effectively communicate. You know, my mother, not having any time to actually learn, uh, learn the English language, she actually relied on me, that was the youngest that was going to school, that I could actually translate for her. So what would that mean? That would mean that I have to accompany her, me as a little nine or 10 year old kid, accompanying your mother to go to a bank to do basic basic banking services or even I remember clearly that we had an issue when we left we left a, a house that we were renting and the landlord was just charging us with all these crazy bullshit you know things that you know we're going to charge you there was a poster on the wall we're going to charge you eighty dollars to take that poster down right so my mom wasn't going to sit there and take it so we actually get we actually we actually wanted to fight so we went there and we sat down in front of the lawyer and that's why I learned a little bit of effective communicating. My mom was right in front of her and she was going, Dile, ese, dile que no lo voy a pagar ni un solo peso. A mí no me va a dar la cara. Te va a pagar 50 dólares por limpiar. No me va a So I would, I would hear this, calm, you know, stay calm, look over and say, Sir, we feel that $50 charge you've given us is very unfair. <laughs> and, this is something, and this is something, you know, I had to do it every single day. So I learned, you know what? You, you got a beautiful language, you have to learn the language. You have to learn the language, and that was um, very pivotal for her not to get ahead in, in her life in the U.S. So when I was 16, 17 year in, um, finishing high school, you know, I had to get serious about my life. I wanted to go to college. I didn't want to live this immigrant lifestyle. I saw what my parents did. I didn't want to, I don't want to be that way. So I was faced with three choices, right? So I could either, one, ask somebody to marry me and get citizenship, which contrary to popular belief, I was super shy with girls back then, so I was like, no, that's not happening. <laughs> okay. either, either two, um, wait for immigration reform and maybe they'll get citizenship there, right? But with Trump plan nowadays, that's totally out of the question. Or three, I said, hey, at the time, I used to work every single weekend. So every Saturday and Sunday, I would get a knock on the door from my dad and we would go more lawns every Saturday and Sunday. So I managed to save $10,000 and I said, you know what? I'm gonna go back to my country in which nobody can tell you, tell you what I can or can't do. So I took the initiative and I took that risk and I actually went back to my country alone to go to college. I was fortunate enough that I motivated my family a few months later and they said, you know what? Fuck it, let's do the same thing, you know? They sold the house for a little money they had from the house. They came back to Mexico, we bought a half finished house and the rest of the money we invested in a business that an uncle had that was really falling apart, but hey, that's the only thing we had. So once again, the circle tends to repeat. We're back in the country, we still don't have training, we don't have that much money, so we have to start all over again, right? But this time it was a bit different. So the business, um, it was, it, was a, it, it mainly focused on the construction business. It, we would sell industrial paint, we would sell grout, we would sell step, step stabilizers and products that were needed for the construction business. So this time, this is the, the next lesson that I want to share to you about, which it comes to like just teamwork. And when I mean by teamwork is we had a business in which we weren't the best, we didn't have the best prices, we didn't have the most inventory, you know, we didn't have the best uh, even knowledge of the product that we were selling or the brand that we were representing. But what we did have is we had a very united team. You know? and, that, and what that meant is everybody had to play off to the best of their abilities and to the best of their skills. So that would mean that my sister, she would take care of all the legal related issues as well as the marketing side. 
My second sister, she would take care of all the administrative issues. Myself, I would take care of all the customer service and all the sales aspect of it. And little by little, that family business in which we took started progressing. We started doing okay for, for ourselves. And I remember um, back in that time, little by little, just based on the customer service we provided, we managed to get you know one big customer after another. And it was at that time in which I got my first taste of international sales or international negotiation. So there was a company called Parker Drilling. They, sub, uh, they were subcontracted by Halliburton. They were going to start drilling. Um, a lot. They, were, they were contracted to drill a lot of sites within Mexico, both onshore and offshore. And you know, a lot of these equipments, in order to get to Mexico, they have to pass through Mexican norm, and they have to be. They have to have the proper maintenance. So we sold the industrial paint that was needed for all these for all these um, parts and equipment that we're bringing over. So you know how it is. You know somebody. My cousin knew somebody that knew somebody that knew somebody that got me that got us a sit down with the country man purchasing manager. So as soon as we got the call, my mom told me, "Okay, you're up. You have to take care of this." Now I'm like 19, 20 years old. You know, I'm, I'm covering very basic concepts in university, and I'm very nervous about actually going over there and talking to this experienced country manager purchasing guy. So I said, okay, fine, I'll do it. So she took me, she bought me a brand new shirt, some new, new pants, some new shoes. She even got me one of those little like man bags, those business man bags that people wear on the side of the shoulder. I was like, all right, cool. I went over, I got, I got to the parking lot, you know, I was super nervous, I didn't know what to do. Uh, you know, I was listening to like early 1990s gangster hip hop just to keep me motivated, because that's, that's what gets me going, I guess. And, um, you know, I didn't know what to do, so I said, you know what, fuck it, I'm going to go in there, I'm going to hit an icebreaker, after the icebreaker, I'm going to do small talk, after small talk, I'm just going to tell them, our product is the best, my company is the best, blah, 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 right? That's a typical sales pitch. So I go in here, I sit down with them, minute five, all right, cool, icebreaker, done. Minute 10, icebreaker, small talk, cool, okay, this is going well. 15 minute mark, okay, more small talk, cool. By the 20th minute mark, I got this guy, you know, for some reason he's taking a liking to me, and he started telling me old war stories about the oil industry, you know, when he used to work in Angola, in Brazil, and he's telling me all these stories, and I said, cool, I mean, sometime I'll let him talk, I mean, some, somewhere in there, I gotta, you know, pitch in my company and the products I do. Within a half an hour, I finally get a chance. I tell him what we do, what we offer, and everything. And he looked at me and he said, all right, kid, look, we're going to do this. First of all, you're going you're gonna to bump up my credit terms from 15 days to 30, day, 30 days. I want my credit line from 200,000 pesos to go up to 400,000 pesos, right? And then you match the prices that we're currently buying. And once you do that, I'll start doing some purchase orders your way. So I said, cool, I left. I agreed to everything. I said, yes, sir, we can do that. Got out of there. I wasn't really sure if he was going to buy from us or not, but luckily enough, that, came, that became one of the big fishes that we actually managed to get down while we were starting our family business. And that family business, it was really, it, it thrived, you know, it, it, it took us from a lower middle class to an upper middle class, just based on the strength and, and the teamwork that all of us had together. And I think the next big lesson that once we started doing well for ourselves, is my, my mom decided to invest in education. So she, she invested in paying college for all of us. And the proof is in the pudding. And, and the outcome of this was that my sister became the first in our family to finish a master's degree. She got her bachelor's and her, and her master's degree done. She currently is a branch manager on an her, her oil company. My middle sister also finished her bachelor's and finished her master's degree. And she owns her own business right now. It's a branch of a family business. I myself, I, I also finished my bachelor's degree, I'm currently doing my master's degree, and I managed to make my way up the ranks, and I, I actually I accomplished a, a dream of mine, which is, I found my own one-bedroom apartment three, three blocks away from the white sandy beaches of the Mexican Caribbean. <laughs> so, um, we, did, we did well for ourselves. So, uh, I told you, oh, my mom, wait, that's, that's the main character, and my mom, uh, well, my mom, you know, she drives a Cadillac, she's a yoga master now. She's an animal activist. I mean, she her, she started this NGO in which they take in um, they take in animals, they nurse them back to they take stray animals and nurse them back to health. And as well, she also she also with the her group they push for um, local laws in which they they were fighting for animal rights. So they, there's actually more animal rights in um, in the state thanks to her. And I guess just to finish this out, when I initially started this, I told you I was going to tell you a story about the American dream, but. The only lie that I've probably said today 
is that's a lie. What I actually told you guys is the Mexican dream, because that's what we lived. And the last lesson I want to leave you is, I think everything, all the paths and all the decisions we made in life, it involves some type of risk. And from my experience and my family's experience, um, a life without risk is a life not worth living. So if we do have some type of risk, just go for it and see how it works out for you. Thank you.